Thanks for coming out this morning. My name is Sean Ede. I'm the uh, director of the Institute for Public Diplomacy and Global Communication, which is co-hosting this event, uh, and also a professor here at uh, George Washington University. Um, I'm very excited to be uh, putting on an event on the political future of Catalonia uh, and focusing in our second panel on uh, public diplomacy challenges, uh, not just for Catalonia, but for sub-states in general. There are uh, quite a few, as I'm sure many of you are aware, around the world um, that are in similar situations. I think uh, Paul Williams and I were just talking a minute ago that there's something like 26 in Europe alone, uh, which is something that I know in the United States most Americans are not particularly aware of. Uh, and they present a number of challenges. There's constitutional challenges, which will be uh, a large part of the focus of the, of the first panel, uh, but also public diplomacy challenges that we'll be talking about uh, in the second panel. And it's a particularly interesting age uh, because of digital diplomacy and the advantages that it brings, but also some of the challenges. But there's also challenges for, um, particularly in terms of foreign policy challenges, for, of course, uh, the, the you know, officially sovereign state, uh, but also other countries, the United States, for instance, how does it deal with uh, the challenges posed by Catalonia and Scotland and other uh, sorts of entities that are trying to um, uh, gain independence uh, in, in this sort of context. Um, I want to have my comments be very brief, so what I want to do is bring up uh, very quickly uh, Roger Albignana, who is the Secretary for Foreign and European Union Affairs from the government of Catalonia to, to help introduce things. But before I do that, I do want to give a, a shout out very quickly to Lola Pack, who is my assistant and also a graduate student here at GW in our global communications program who focuses on public diplomacy, uh, who has been instrumental in helping put all this together, even though she's coming right out of spring break and she spent her spring break in Brazil working on a capstone project for her master's program. Uh, so a working break, and yet she was still able to pull all this off. So thank you, Lola. Um, and then we'll get rolling right into our first panel. So uh, without further ado, let me introduce uh, Roger Albignana. Well, thank you very much, uh, Sean, uh, and very good morning to, um, uh, to all of you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to thank the organizers at uh, George Washington University, in particular, uh, Sean Ede, our host and director uh, at the Institute for Public Diplomacy and Global uh, Communication uh, for organizing such a, such a, a wonderful uh, conference here uh, in Washington, D.C. I would also like to thank um, the Public Diplomacy Council uh, of uh, Catalonia for co-organizing this, uh, this conference and allow me also to thank uh, our panelists uh, attending from near and far, uh, in particular uh, ambassadors uh, uh, Bandrell and Sar Sarukan, who will be here uh, later today, Assistant Secretary uh, Crowley and Professors uh, Sanjama and Williams. What about the uh, international vocation of, uh, of Catalonia? Uh, as you know, um, the international vocation of Catalonia is far from a new phenomenon. In fact, one could argue that Catalonia's formal engagement uh, with the world began uh, back in uh, 1258. Uh, that was a long time ago, indeed, uh, <laughs> especially for, uh, for a country such as the, uh, the United States, when uh, in 1258, uh, when uh, King Jaume I, James I, of the Catalan Aragon uh, crown, began the process of creating a system of commercial and maritime uh, law, later known as the Consulates of the Sea, uh, which for the first time regulated um, commerce in the Western uh, Mediterranean uh, region. Uh, in fact, uh, five centuries later, uh, Catalonia's importance uh, as an international trade hub uh, was not lost uh, on the newly created uh, United States of America. And in fact, it was President uh, John Adams, uh, who was uh, second president of the United States, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. Uh, Correct. Uh, who created the first American consulate uh, in Barcelona in 1797. Uh, 
This was, in fact, one of the uh, America's first consulates uh, in the world. In doing so, uh, his priority uh, was, of course, to promote relations uh, between the young America uh, and Catalonia and that part of the, uh, of the world, uh, of the known world. Today, uh, the United States and, Ca and Catalonia do some uh, 4 billion uh, of trade, uh, of bilateral trade annually, uh, with a balance uh, slightly positive in favor of the United States. Uh, to give you an idea uh, of what that means in practical terms, uh, Catalonia has a larger population uh, than Denmark's and Finland's, and its uh, uh, GDP is situated between uh, the two of them. Uh, on the other hand, Catalonia has more companies uh, in the U.S. Uh, than Denmark, uh, Finland, uh, or Austria uh, alone. Uh, and the U.S. exports to Catalonia are similar to U.S. exports to Austria uh, and Sweden. It was released uh, not long ago that the U.S. government considered of a strategic importance on the Iberian Peninsula mainly three items. Uh, first, the Straits uh, of Gibraltar uh, between Europe uh, and North Africa. Uh, second, the gas pipeline to Algeria that, as you know, brings a lot of gas uh, to the Iberian Peninsula, and, and now we are aiming uh, to connect it uh, to, the rest, uh, uh, to the rest of Europe. And thirdly, Grifols. Grifols uh, is a Catalan pharmaceutical company uh, with companies um, and, uh, and, and plans, uh, at least uh, in North Carolina and California. I think they also have something uh, uh, settled in, uh, in Texas. Uh, so we are very proud to see that our companies uh, are not only investing in the United States, but that some are even considered uh, strategic assets by uh, our friends uh, here in the US. Um, finally, I want to stress uh, the fact that the United States uh, is also of a huge and a strategic importance for Catalonia. Uh, for these reasons, we have both uh, delegations uh, in New York City and in Washington, D.C., uh, which handle institutional affairs, trade and investment, tourism and cultural and language promotion. Uh, and additional commercial offices in Miami uh, and Silicon Valley. This relationship, which is nearly as long as the United States has existed, as I said uh, before, is what brings us here today, because we want to explain to our American friends uh, firsthand what is happening in Catalonia. So you know, Catalonia will hold uh, elections, uh, early elections, or snap elections, uh, next uh, September 27th uh, this year. Um, the objective uh, of these elections is to obtain a majority in Parliament uh, and to put evidence uh, of Catalonia's desires uh, to initiate a political process uh, to become a, a new state uh, within the European Union, uh, thus completing uh, the political process that began uh, two years ago, which focused on the right of the Catalan people as a nation uh, to decide on its political future. In holding these elections, our goal and commitment uh, is to follow the noblest traditions of democracy and freedom of expression, two traditions firmly rooted in the American democracy uh, and ones we commit ourselves to emulating throughout this process. To be honest with you, uh, we would have preferred to see a legally binding referendum on independence, uh, like the one that took place in the United Kingdom and in Scotland in September uh, 2014. But that was simply not possible after uh, attempts of negotiations uh, with the Spanish government uh, for more uh, than two years. Um, as stated by the president uh, of the Catalan government, uh, Mr. Artur Mas, last November in Barcelona, Catalonia and the Spanish government are on different frequencies, while Catalonia calls for better and more self-governance, um, the Spanish government executes a process of recentralization uh, within Spain. Let me say that today both positions are, are even further than a couple of uh, years ago, despite the attempts uh, to negotiate a deal uh, from the side of the, uh, of the Catalan uh, institutions. 
The current political situation in Catalonia has led us to use our foreign action as a tool to raise awareness of the process going on in Catalonia, as foreign action is deeply linked to public diplomacy. Our main goal is to help our allies, other countries, and opinion makers understand that ours is a de 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 um, democratic process whose main goal is, on the first place, to let Catalan people vote and decide on their political futures. For this, public diplomacy is a key tool developed by the Catalan government and the Catalan civil society to foster greater understanding amongst foreign public opinion makers. The Catalan international strategy places in the world. It is a policy that is capable of consolidating alliances and which sets Catalonia in direct contact with the European Union, with other governments, and with other multilateral organizations, as well as civil society and Catalan citizens and communities abroad. Uh, the political future of Catalonia will depend on the will of its citizens and its ability to strengthen its role and position as a coherent international actor. And therefore, we count with the foreign action and its tools and goals as follows. First, and mainly, um, internationalization of the Catalan economy. Secondly, bilateral and multilateral relations. Thirdly, the European Union, which is a world per se, specific world per se, as you know. Uh, fourth, uh, the law of external action and EU relations. Not long ago, uh, we passed in the Catalan Parliament uh, with a large support and a large majority, uh, a very advanced law uh, on external relations and EU relations, which no other sub-state uh, governments in the European uh, Union still has. Unfortunately, the Spanish government has decided to appeal uh, to the Constitution court in Spain against these laws. So it is not yet uh, suspended on a temporary basis, but we uh, unfortunately think that it will be soon suspended. And fifth, uh, public diplomacy. I will not go in details on all these uh, priority goals uh, that the foreign action policy of the Catalan government has, but let me say that when it comes to public diplomacy, especially because we are dealing here today with public diplomacy and the process uh, in Catalonia, um, we have set up, I would say, probably two ambitious goals, and probably later on uh, the Secretary General of the Council, of the Catalan Council for Public Diplomacy, will go uh, more in depth. First, development of a public diplomacy strategy, uh, and here we count on the representatives uh, from the political, social, economic, and academic uh, arena to influence the external perception of Catalonia as a country with an image of uh, quality and prestige uh, that can be trusted and becoming the leading economy in uh, the south of Europe uh, with its own language, as you know, and cultures, uh, which are differentiated from the rest of those of the Iberian Peninsula. Um, and secondly, uh, development of the international communication uh, pro program uh, to better communicate and address to the um, uh, to the foreign media, which is also one of the objectives of our uh, public uh, dipo diplomacy uh, institutions uh, or institution. To um, uh, to finish, um, well, I, I would like to course, to welcome you all, uh, to thank you for uh, being here uh, in this almost spring day uh, here in Washington, uh, D.C., with, uh, with so mild temperatures. Uh, wish you a very uh, good uh, discussion. Thank you once more, uh, or thank once more our panelists uh, for being here, and I look forward to hearing all the discussions, and what's more important, I look forward uh, to hearing the conclusions of this, uh, of this meeting. So thank you uh, once again. Uh, and I hope to see you uh, around. Thank you very much, Roger. <coughs> um, I'll, I'll very quickly, I'm PJ Crowley, um, a fellow at the Institute for Public Diplomacy and Global Communication, a uh, professor of practice here and a former uh, Assistant Secretary of State you know, for Public Affairs. Um, and I, I very quickly will introduce the panelists. Uh, you know, if you've got one of these um, folders, uh, it has the great bios of our distinguished panel here. 
but uh, uh, you know, to my left is you know, Francis Vendrell, the adjunct professor of international relations at George uh, at John Hopkins University, former UN Assistant Secretary General. You know, to his left, uh, Mark you know, Sanjame, uh, visiting professor of nationalism and self determination processes. The University of Quebec uh, in Montreal in their Department of Political Science. And then finally, you know, Paul Williams, the Rebecca Grazier Professor of Law in International Relations at American University and the founder of Public International Law and Policy Group. Each of our panelists will speak for roughly you know, 10 minutes and then we'll um, have a brief discussion among ourselves and then open up you know, to the floor. Uh, when we get to that point, you know, if you have a question, ask the panel. Uh, wait for the microphone. Anyway, second speaker. Who's who's for, Mark is first. Yeah. Okay. So I, I think Take you it away. I think you may want that. Okay. Well, I, I will speak from there. Standing from oh, there. That's fine. All right. So um, thank you so much for inviting me. As a Catalan scho scholar, I would say that uh, it's an honor being here, but it's also a duty, because uh, participating in an event organized by my government, foreign policy, my government, so it's, it's a pleasure, uh, but it's also a duty. Let me say that uh, this spring weather coming from Montreal is making me more prone to, <laughs> to speak and to be open, so if I... If I uh, if I speak more than 10 minutes, uh, please stop me uh, before. <laughs> so um, as Roger Albignana already pointed out, uh, talking about Catalan politics and Spanish politics nowadays is talking about self-determination. Self-determination, which is a topic uh, that has been has been studied for a long time in, in political science. And what I'm going to do is focusing on this idea, on self-determination. Then I will talk about federalism. And finally, I will talk a little bit more on the Catalan legitimacy and Catalan claims uh, nowadays on uh, secession and self-determination. Uh, of course, um, I should say that um, a lot has been said uh, on, on, on self-determination. And uh, let me start just by a kind of uh, historical, uh, historical uh, overview in general of the emergence of new states uh, during, the last, uh, during the last century. Um, and we could talk about self-determination and secession as a kind of paradox, let's say. So, in a sense, uh, secession and self-determination have never been fully regulated in constitutional law and international law, but on the other hand, or it, it remains some, a topic which is controversial, but on the other hand, we have seen the emergence of new states uh, at the beginning of the, of the 19th century. We had few states. We had just 30 states. Nowadays, we have almost 200 states. So, this is the first paradox. The second paradox is that um, we could say that the meaning of self-determination has changed a lot over time. So um, after the First World War, it meant the disintegration of big empires, like Austro-Hungarian Empire and Ottoman Empire's North Empires. I am completely sure that the students that are here are already on this uh, on these historical issues. The second, the second meaning of self-determination was applied to colonies and to the decolonization process. And that was basically the juridification. That was the meaning that was, uh, let's say, written into international law at that time. Um, I have to say that self-determination of the people appears in the first article of UN Charter, as you probably, as you probably know, as a, as a founding principle of international, international relationships. And a third meaning came uh, by the disintegration of the Soviet Union self-determination. So what do all these, all these uh, meanings have in common? In my opinion, what, what is at the basis of self-determination, as Woodrow Wilson already said in his uh, 14 points, is the claim for democracy, democracy and freedom. What's the meaning of self-determination? Empowerment, the capacity to decide by yourself, democratic government, reaching a democratic system. And that's more or less, uh, that's more or less what I would say that uh, it's at the basis of this, of this concept. Uh, let me say something about Spain. What has been the dominant uh, political model in Spain during the 20th century? It has not been democracy. 
So Spain is not among those old democracies that we know in Europe, but among those which are new democracies, let's say. Um, there was a short period in the 30s when Spain was uh, a democratic county, country during the Second Republic, but as you probably know, the civil war ended a coup d'etat, which was not successful. The civil war ended this period and came four years, four years of dictatorship of General Franco. At that time, the Catalans had a certain uh, degree of autonomy, but the Catalans lost the war, so they lost this uh, uh, kind of self-determination within the Spanish state. We just, we just, um, a democracy came back to, to Spain in the 78 with the new uh, democratic constitution, and the Catalans kind of um, got a certain degree of self-determination de self or at least um, uh, autonomy uh, at that time. So um, the meaning that we usually, or uh, international relationships usual, usually give to self-determination nowadays is the idea of autonomy. So minority nations are entitled to a certain degree of autonomy, certain degree of autonomy. Then we could ask ourselves why the Catalans are claiming are claiming secession nowadays. Why the Catalan government is making these efforts for voting a referendum on self-determination? Well, it has a lot to do. It has a lot to do with uh, the Spain, uh, let's say, territorial system, the Spanish territorial model. So uh, the Catalan government has been claiming for a long time that this solution to uh, um, Catalan uh, claims or Catalan demands is not fulfilled, is not achieved with the current territorial model in Spain. Why? Because Spain is not, is not a multinational federation. So internal self-determination, so to speak, which has been the solution given to minority nations all over the world, internal self-determination through federal models, through federal models, like the Canadian one in Quebec, has not been achieved by Spain. Of course, here there is a lot of debate, and I will not, I will not explain each argument for arguing that Spain is a federal system and why it is not, but let me point out just three arguments of why, why I defend, explaining why I defend that Spain is not a multinational federation. According to the Constitutional Court, the Constitutional Court that has been blocking during a long time uh, a referendum in Catalonia, in Spain there is a single state. We are now in a federal country. How many states are, are there are in, 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 in the United States? There are many states. So in Spain there is just one state and some regions, let's say, one state and regions. There is a single nation. So we are not in a country like Canada, another example of federation, where they say, well, no, we are binational, let's say, multicultural federation. We let Quebec to vote, and so on and so forth. No, in Spain, there is a single nation. And another important point, another important element to say that Spain is not a fully multinational federation is that um, regions are not involved in shared rule. So regions. Spanish regions, Spanish uh, autonomous communities, including Catalonia, are not involved into Madrid politics, let's say. So there are no blocking capacities, there are no blocking mechanisms for organic laws in the Spanish parliament. So if you know, if you know a little about federalism, you would probably agree with me that Spain might be a regional system, but it is not a multinational federation. So. In, is internal self-determination fulfilled? Is internal self-determination granted for the Catalans? No. Internal self-determination is not granted for the Catalan autonomy. So if we want to understand, if we would like to understand uh, Catalan public opinion, uh, we could go through many, many, many survey data, but I will show you just one question that has been posed during the last years to the Catalans by the, the Catalan official surveys. Unfortunately, I, I, I just have the data until 2014, but we, we could go on until 2015. Uh, this is a typical question. Which uh, political system would you prefer for Catalonia within Spain? And there are four answers. Status quo, a federal state, less powers than today, a region, being a region, not an autonomous community, and independence, and independence. So as you can see, in 2006, 
the preferred the preferred option for the Catalans was or stat by the Catalans was or status quo or federalism. What happened during the last years? Well, as you probably know, Catalonia tried to let's say update update its constitution, its own constitution, the Catalan State of Autonomy, and this updating this recognition for more powers for Catalonia was rejected by the Constitutional Court, as Roger Vignana already said uh, before. So, as we can see, this decision by the Spanish model to not update, nowadays the Spanish Constitution has more than uh, 35 years, uh, is more than 35 years old, and has not been, let's say, um, deeply reformed during the last years, has not been reformed, basically. It's a very rigid constitution. So, as we can see, the impact uh, to the Catalan public opinion has been an incredible growth of support, uh, of secession support. Right? This is linked to the lack of internal self-determination, to the possibility of internal self-determination in Spain. So if we do not have internal self-determination, we'll go for external self-determination. That means uh, secession. Right? Let me say that we could discuss a lot about if secession is a majoritarian option for the Catalans or not, but what is clear from this data is that status quo, it is not an option today for Catalans. So there is a majority for independence or not, I don't know, but there is a majority against rejecting the status quo. So uh, there is a, major, a clear majority for more autonomy. We can see that too from um, um, Last, uh, the last uh, Catalan uh, bills that has been passed through the Catalan Parliament supporting the process for Catalan self-determination. So here you can, be, you can see the, the result of uh, several, several uh, um, votations, that has, uh, several votes that have taken place in, in, in Catalan Parliament, passing bills supporting, supporting the self-determination process. You can see the support to the current government coalition, sovereignty declaration, the question to the consultation, uh, which, has not, which was not voted in the parliament, but was a, a kind of political agreement, uh, the consultation petition to the Spanish government, or the popular consultation bills. As you can see, out of uh, 135 deputies, these laws have always, have always been over majoritarian, let's say, in the Catalan parliament. So have been voted by, by uh, around 70% of the Catalan deputies. Right? So there is, there, is, there is democratic legitimacy for the Catalan claims for uh, voting, for voting on independence uh, in Catalonia. Usually these this, this votes, usually the, 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 the conflict between the Catalan government and the Spanish government has been, has been described as a, as, as a clash between democratic legitimacy and legality. Democratic legitimacy against constitutional legitimacy. Why? Because the Spanish government says, no, the Constitution, in the Constitution, is forbidden. It's forbidden a referendum on independence, let alone independence. So all, all that things that you are talking about are completely forbidden. Yes, that's true. There is a clash, there is a clear clash between legality and Catalan legitimacy, but there is also a clash, there is also a clash between democratic legitimacies. In the second table, you can see the single vote that has been, that has been produced in the Spanish parliament on a referendum on secession and self-determination in Catalonia um, that was uh, the, last, uh, the last August, August uh, 2014. And you can see that out of 350 Spanish deputies, just 47 supported the referendum in Catalonia. So we have two clashes, we have a clash between democratic legitimacy and legality, and we have a clash between democratic legitimacy in Catalonia and democratic legitimacy in the Spanish parliament. So we have two clashes. The question is, do we have a democratic solution? Do we have, uh, let's say, um, tools for solving this political conflict? As a political scientist, I, I would say, well, almost all political systems, almost all political solutions have already been invented. Right? We have similar self-determination conflicts in, in the world. We have similar self-determination uh, problems in the world. We can look to just two cases, just two cases where self-determination has been discussed for a long time 
in a context, in a context that we are we compare apples with apples, in a context that we compare liberal democracies with liberal democracies. So Spain claims to be a liberal democracy. Let's compare Spain to Canada and the United Kingdom. Let's compare Spain to Canada and the United Kingdom. What's the solution according to the Canadian Constitutional Court to Quebec uh, self-determination claims? Well, we have the opinion, the opinion in, uh, uh, in 1998 uh, uh, by the, by the uh, uh, Canadian Constitutional Court when he said, well, maybe Quebec has not, Quebec has not a, unilateral, a unilateral right to do self-determination and go on their own and just make secession happen. They do not have this right because they belong to Canada. But we should talk about that. We should talk about that. So they are entitled to vote. They can vote on that. And then we should negotiate. We should discuss the solution. We should talk about constitutional politics on the basis of four principles. Federalism, rule of law, democracy, and minority rights protection. So we have this example, for instance, for the Spanish case. Are these principles nowadays uh, considered by the Spanish Constitutional Court? No, just one of them, rule of law. The constitutional, is, this is banned in the Constitution, you cannot vote. They forget about the principle of federalism, they forget about the principle of democracy, they forget about the principles of minority rights protection. Second example, Edinburgh Agreement, 2012. United Kingdom, a state which is not a federation, but they reach a kind of federal agreement, let's say, for letting the Scottish, Scottish people vote. On the basis of what? On the basis of the Edinburgh Agreement, signed between uh, Prime Minister David Cameron and Prime Minister, and Prime Minister Alex Salmond. On which basis? On the basis of working together in matters of mutual interest. On what principles? Good communication and mutual respect. <coughs> Good communication and mutual respect. That are the, the two examples, I think, reasonable to compare with and reasonable to take into account when we talk about Catalan self-determination in Spain. My question is, are these principles considered by the Spanish Constitutional Court nowadays? No. Are these principles considered by main political actors in Spain nowadays? No. I think that these principles would be, would be an inspiration for uh, Spain uh, in dealing with uh, Catalan demands. Last, last a bonus track, and I let, and I let uh, Professor Vendrell to speak. Bonus track. Usually, in, in liberal democracies, when secession is voted, loses the vote. So referendums are usually lost by secessionists. So even from a Machiavellian strategic mind, <laughs> let's say, uh, let Catalans vote, because they will vote no to secession, that mind would be right, that this idea would be right. In general, and we have some cases in the United States, certainly in Puerto Rico, in general, these referendums are defeated by the state. So from a strategic point of view, it could even be, could even be difficult to understand not letting uh, Catalans vote. So thank you very much. I'm looking forward for comments, critiques, and, and debate later on. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. um, let, let me start by, by, by saying that um, as a former diplomat, I, I, I'm not a soothsayer, so I can't, uh, I can't really deal with how the future of Catalonia will be in 10 years' time. Um, but I think perhaps we could uh, draw some lessons uh, and look at the situation today. Um, there is, um, uh, the first, first of all, um, Catalonia is seen uh, clearly by the international community, uh, for those who even bother to perceive whether there is an issue, as a secondary matter. It is not a vital issue uh, either in Europe, let alone overseas. Um, but at the same time, uh, we have, people have to realize that um, Nations are prisoners of their past, and that you cannot simply ignore what happened before 
uh, in looking uh, uh, looking at the situation today. Ireland by 1910 probably had as much uh, or could have had because it was in the, the, the Home Rule Bill didn't fully pass until after World War One. Um, could have had uh, a perfectly decent amount of home rule. However, the history of Ireland, the the the, the problems that Ireland faced with England uh, in uh, during various centuries led uh, to, for the Irish simply home rule was not enough, and independence took place. Um, we also have to realize that um, international law is an evolving um, it's an evolving law. It is not static. What was not a violation of international law in 1950 is a violation of international law today. Example, for, exa for example, governments do not have the right to deal with the subjects or with their citizens as they please. Uh, they do have obligations and they can be held accountable for violations of individual human rights. That's an, uh, evolved through the practice of the last uh, 60 or 70 years. Um, the decision whether uh, one a country supports self-determination or not is very largely a political decision. Uh, when it comes to um, Ireland, the United States has been incredibly sympathetic. Uh, when it's come to Scotland, uh, it apparently wasn't. Uh, why it wasn't it? <laughs> because probably the Scottish National Party was also talking rather darkly of eliminating um, uh, the, atom the um, uh, atomic bases in, in Scotland. So that made the US nervous. Uh, in the case of Catalonia, I don't think you should be either nervous or not. I think we are. We would be, if we ever came to that. I think we would be uh, pragmatic enough as to be uh, loyal members of NATO. Um, uh, we, we approach Kosovo uh, in a different way than we approach Abkhazia, and um, uh, and international law, as I said, uh, is not static. We never thought. In the uh, in the 80s, that the Ukraine, or uh, Belarus, or um, or Moldova had the right to self-determination. Uh, it was only the collapse of the Soviet Union, just as the collapse of the um, Yugoslavia, that led us to believe or to decide that they did have the right to self-determination. It was also an easy way out in the way. Actually, the decision was taken. In, in other words, um, countries in the Soviet Union, nations in the Soviet Union, that were not constituent parts of the of the Soviet Union, were denied the right of self-determination. Let's say Chechnya, or you could say, um, or which were part of, of uh, and yet Belarus or the Central Asian Republics, uh, where, in my view, there was no demand at that time for independence, uh, found themselves landed with independence. The same uh, can be said about former Yugoslavia. Uh, so, uh, but there is no question that there is a bias against secession. I just heard today our uh, Mr. Sean um, uh, state that Catalonia is an example of 27 other or 26 other sub-state entities that are seeking recognition. I must say that uh, the last thing, at least from my point of view, and I think from the Catalan point of view, the last thing we would uh, want is a proliferation of little nations. We are not talking here in, te in terms of Europe of, pa of Padania or of South Tyrol or of Friesia, Friesland, or any of these uh, um, potential issues. Here we are talking of a part of Spain uh, at the moment which considers itself, and I think very few would deny it in Catalonia, that we are a nation. That doesn't mean necessarily we have to be a state, but we are definitely a nation. And when told by, uh, by the Constitutional Court, which is an eminently political court, 
much even more so than the Supreme Court of the United States, um, denies that we have the right to call ourselves a nation despite approval by the Catalan government, by the Catalan parliament, and by the Spanish parliament, this inevitably has consequences. There isn't any uh, sub-state in Europe of seven million and a half people who, who speak in a different language uh, that demands, at least through its elected representatives by a majority, the right to decide. And we are now talking of the right to decide. But having said that, I am aware that uh, this is all too complicated for a politician that only spends perhaps one minute thinking about the issue. Um, and <laughs> there is a natural anti-state, anti-bias. There is a bias against, against secession across the world. Um, and in favor of the respect for the sanctity of international borders. Uh, and that is a problem that Catalonia has to realize. Um, in, particularly for a large country like the United States, the lesser <coughs> number of states, the better. Henry Kissinger and successors of Henry Kissinger have been demanding to have one phone number for Europe. Um, <laughs> they still don't. They have still 28. And, uh, of course, with Catalonia, it will be 20, 29. So uh, I can see, I, can, I, I realize that this is, there is a knee-jerk uh, reaction against one more country or one more little place wanted to um, have their own take. And, um, and there is, um, uh, at the same time, there is also a knee-jerk reaction about being burdened with new issues. Um, even a country as large as the US, let alone European countries, they can rarely handle more than two crises at a time. So uh, even if these crises are extremely violent. Oh, oh there are so, a few more than two right now. So <laughs> the idea that um, the United States, or for that matter, the Euro major European countries, will spend much time worrying about Catalonia, this isn't going to happen. Uh, it won't happen unless things were to reach uh, a point that uh, forced the, what most governments have, which is an ostrich-like approach, to issues, to problems. We don't want to hear about them. We, we have enough as it is, and we certainly are not going to look back at the history of the last 200 years to decide whether there is some merit in what Catalonia is demanding. Uh, you, uh, I have had dealt for many years on Af with Afghanistan and with East Timor. Uh, in Afghanistan, clearly, uh, the international community did not even bother to look at the history of Afghanistan 10 years before the Taliban came over. They might have drawn some good lessons if they had. In, on East Timor, which had the recognized, an internationally recognized right of self-determination, uh, it only, people only paid attention, or governments only paid attention when the situation became virtually intolerable and the Suharto regime uh, had collapsed. So there is also, um, as I always um, used to accuse my fellow diplomats, of an innate optimism. Things will work out somehow. Um, and governments don't want to be, to receive tables from their ambassadors saying, oh, there is a problem in Catalonia that we need to now worry about. They much prefer to hear nothing or to hear that, well, that's an issue that will, it so, will be solved by itself. Furthermore, to the extent that one acknowledges that there is a conflict, um, there is a tendency also to think, well, the region should deal with it. There is an increasing regionalization of issues. Um, and to the extent that Catalonia becomes an issue, or has become an issue, I think the tendency in this country would be, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, and certainly the UN, in the, the tendency would be to say, well, if there is an issue, let the Europeans um, deal with it. And, and so I, I think this is... so. Uh, I, I, I don't see in the near future, uh, barring cha a change of circumstances, a great deal of attention on Catalonia. Now, it could be, there could be a change of circumstances. Um, 
Uh, and I, I, th I think and, and that would also be uh, an evolution in the way Europe looks at, this, at these issues. At the end of the day, um, uh, how a democratic country deals with demands for self-determination cannot be the same than the way the Sudan dealt with South Sudan or Ethiopia dealt with Eritrea. Uh, clearly, I hope we have reached a much greater degree of evolution in our democracy. And it is uh, something that perhaps uh, Europe may eventually come to realize. What do you do when a majority of people and a majority of elected representatives demand the right, not necessarily yet of secession, but the right to be able to decide the future of the country? And there are, the, as you have heard, in the last 10 years, uh, first we are prisoners of the past. We are prisoners of the, of the 200 years when Catalonia's uh, identity was erased. We are at attempted to, er to be er uh, erased. And we are prisoners of what happened during the Civil War and the uh, suppression of Catalonia as a nation or as a language for 40 years. Um, so at some point, there may be, uh, uh, and there has to be a, a response. A government cannot simply, the central government cannot simply say, we refuse even to talk about this. Uh, certainly, the case that you've mentioned, Quebec and, certain, and, and Scotland, uh, in, and Belgium for that matter, would be cases where uh, th there is not one single case in, uh, um, in, in, West, in a Western democracy where there has been a refusal to even enter into a dialogue. Um, so I'll stop here. Um, um, and um, I think the time perhaps is uh, to have a proper discussion on this. Thank you. Thanks, BJ. <coughs> uh, as BJ mentioned, I'm a lawyer. And lawyers are always invited to the party to give, to give the bad news. Um, so, <laughs> so I'll do my job. Uh, the bad news is Catalonia has a problem, and it's called Brussels. But lawyers like to be invited back to the party, so we also bring some good news with us. The good news is Madrid, The Hague, and New York aren't really the problems that they're perceived. So let's start with the good news. Madrid, why is Madrid not a problem? Madrid is not a problem because it's predictable. If you look at Mark's listing of all of the states that had referendum, all of the central governments opposed self-determination. They opposed secession, even when they granted a referendum. Why? Because that's their job. They're the central government. They're supposed to keep the country together. They're supposed to, to a degree, centralize powers. Now, why this is not a bad idea, or not a problem, it's difficult, it's a complication, it's consternation. But Madrid is there. It's got its position. Catalonia can figure out what its strategy is going to be to deal with Madrid. It can try out different tactics. It has flexibility to try to deal with Madrid. But Madrid is there. It's stationary. It's clear. Catalonia also has the option of ignoring Madrid. And we'll talk about that in just a second. So it's going to be a difficult situation, but Madrid is not your problem. The Hague is also not Catalonia's problem. You will get any number of international lawyers who will say sovereignty, 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 territorial integrity, there is no legal right to self-determination externally, uh, and they'll cite the UN Charter up and down. And they're all correct. You will also get a number of international lawyers who will talk about self-determination, who will cite the UN Charter up and down, pointing out that it also provides for self-determination. They too are right. International law has not made up its mind. Now, the most recent, so there's a sovereignty first community out there and a self-determination first community. And they basically agreed that international law does not provide for a right of independence. They've also agreed that international law does not deny the right of external self-determination. 
And in the latest round of this sort of evasion of making a decision has gone with self-determination movements. The International Court of Justice in The Hague in the Kosovo case ruled that Kosovo had a right to declare independence. But in the way of all good lawyers, they didn't answer the question that people wanted to know, which was, could Kosovo become independent or was Kosovo independent? They answered the question that the UN General Assembly asked, which it was, could Kosovo declare independence? And the court said, yeah, sure, Kosovo can declare independence. That doesn't create any legal obligation on the international community to recognize Kosovo's declaration. So you've got a little bit of an edge out there with the ICJ case lately, but, but don't invest, don't invest too, much, too much in it. <laughs> um, but you can take The Hague off the map. So you don't have to worry about whether international law is somehow going to constrain Catalonia's options or keep it uh, in Spain. <coughs> also, New York. The international community isn't really a problem. As Ambassador Vendrell had said, you ask any, any diplomat, any secretary, any ministry of foreign affairs, no self-determination, no, no, no. When I worked at the State Department in the early 90s, uh, we were dealing with Yugoslavia, Soviet Union, Ukraine came seeking recognition, and the answer, all of the internal traffic, no, no, no. <laughs> and I asked one of the diplomats, I said, well, why am I not on this issue? You know, you're like the desk officer for Yugoslavia, the desk officer for the Soviet Union, the answer is clearly no. And he's like, oh, our policy is always no, until it's yes. <laughs> and so you as the lawyer have to prepare us for yes. We have gone yes 36 times in the last 20 years. In the last 20 years, the international community has gone from no to yes three dozen times. Times. So maybe 37 is, is a lucky number for Catalonia. Um, so there will be a lot of this resistance because it is destabilizing and it does complicate things, but it also happens on a regular basis. So the international community um, is, not going to be, is not going to be your barrier. What is your barrier, what is your problem, is, is Brussels. And the reason why Brussels is your problem is it simply doesn't have a policy. It hasn't even settled on no. It doesn't know whether it's, sorry, I was going to say it doesn't know whether it's no, but it's <laughs> undecided as to whether it's no, and it's certainly not yes. Now, the roots of the indecision, and this is why it's difficult to deal with Brussels, is with Madrid, you know where it stands. You can strategize, you can deploy tactics. With Brussels, you don't know where Brussels stands, and it's going to be important because that's where the international community is going to look to. The international community is going to say it's going to ring up Madrid's phone number, but it's not going to ring up Madrid's phone number. It's going to try to ring up that single phone number of Europe, Brussels, and ask, right, we're going to take our lead from you. And they probably get a busy signal or a, what is it, a disconnected, what is that when it beeps? <laughs> this number is no longer in service. Um, they'll probably get a no longer working number when they call Brussels to ask. They'll say, they leave do. a message. <laughs> leave a message. <laughs> we'll get back to you. Uh, well, the, the roots of the problem in, in, with Brussels are, is Yugoslavia. Uh, when Yugoslavia requested recognition, when the Soviet Union requested recognition, the European Union said, right, this is the hour of Europe. We're going to have a common foreign and security policy. We all agree to recognize in unison. And the Germans said, great, and we're recognizing Kosovo. So in unison, we're, sorry, we're recognizing Croatia. And so in unison, we're all going to recognize Croatia. And the Europeans did. And they said, that's the end of our common foreign policy with respect to recognition of self-determination movements and secession. And they've done the ostrich approach of putting their head in the sand. And they are amazingly good at that. <laughs> they did this with Cyprus. <laughs> Cyprus is a member of the European Union. Every single Cypriot has a European Union passport and the rights and privileges of European citizen. And for half of the island, the key, the rules, the obligations, the rights don't apply. So you have a half European state in Europe and on that half that isn't part of Europe, you have European citizens. They kind of look past that. They've moved on to Kosovo. Kosovo is recognized by 103 member states of the international community. It's a member of the World Bank. It's a member of the IMF. And it is not recognized by five European states. Despite all of the diplomatic pressure from the United States, despite all of the concerns about more instability in that part of the, the Europe's backyard, front porch, where do you want to call it, five European member states have failed to recognize Kosovo. And then you come to Scotland, where it's right there. It is in Europe. 
And the European community says, well, we're not really sure if Scotland could become a member of the European Union. And then questions for follow-up, questions for clarification, leave a message, non-working number. Silence. When the Brits started to indicate, the British started to indicate that they might be willing to accept Scotland into the European Union for, for economic reasons, because they wanted to keep, they didn't want to destabilize or a frozen economic conflict in their backyard, Madrid pops up and says, yeah, but we'll veto Scotland's entrance into the European Union. And so you have a situation where even the parent state, the predecessor state, in negotiation with an entity seeking self-determination says, right, you, we don't want you to go, but you may go, but we want this to be a happy separation and we want to maintain our economic infrastructure. Another European member state came up and said, no, we're going to stop that from happening. What did Brussels say? Eh, 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 busy signal. No answer from Brussels on what that would be with Scotland. This is going to be the difficulty. You run the risk of the European Union freezing by saying, if we recognize Catalonia, then we have Belgium, we have something in Italy, Romania, Slovakia, and all these other ones that I can't pronounce that we've traveled through at some point in time and had a beer in a pub, and then all of a sudden, Monrovia, OK, that wants to be independent. They're really worried about that. But on the other hand, if Catalonia does have a referendum, does assert its independence, and the European Union says, no, you'll have 7 million European citizens using the euro living outside of the European Union and will become a frozen economic conflict, which would be de highly destabilizing, given um, Roger's earlier conversation about uh, the three security interests in that region being the economics, one of the main security, national security interests of the United States and the security interests of NATO, um, would be hugely, hugely destabilizing. And so what you need to be prepared for is this battle about EU membership. It comes down to, is the European Union an international organization where its members get to decide whether new states can join? Or is it a treaty which has an international organization in order to implement the obligations of the treaty? And there, international law is very clear. Treaties continue with successor states. So you'd have a situation where the Rome Treaty all the way through Maastricht and other treaties would continue with the successor states and then you'd have to figure out how they would participate in that organization. Also, citizenship. Seven million European Union citizens. I've been surprised that folks will say, oh, well, they'll just lose their citizenship. Not even Bashir, who is of Khartoum, indicted for genocide, took away the citizenship when the separation of the South turned around from the North until they had worked out some negotiated <coughs> arrangements. The European Union can't simply disenfranchise 7 million European citizens because the country that they're a part of decides to separate from the European Union. And then there's the questions of the debts, the assets, the membership in the IMF and the World Bank. Helping, this is your job as representative of the EU mission, EU, EU, EU infrastructure, helping the Europeans sort out the membership, the treaties, the international organizations, the World Bank, the IMF, those types of questions so that the EU can get to yes so that it can actually have a policy, so that it can actually have a response when Catalonia dials up Brussels and says, we're moving, we're going, we're having a referendum. We've either negotiated something or not negotiated something with Madrid, but we're moving forward, and this portfolio is shifting to Brussels. That Brussels has a way of seeing itself clearly to having an answer and to having that answer be yes. Wow. <laughs> I'm just trying to get my head around the idea of the EU at 54 <laughs> and, and, and what, what that would mean. Um, but it, it, let, let's start out a little bit at, the, at, at, a, at a, a, a macro or meta-theoretical lo level. You, you, have, you have two dynamics that are working in their way around the world and particularly across Europe. You, you've got the supranational identity of being European. Um, whether that's true or not, um, you know, nationalism hasn't gone away, as we know, you know, versus a dynamic in a an increasingly fragmented world that is pulling people towards, um, you know, a, a local identity, um, and and you know, you 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 have the benign cases of that. 
uh, you know, Scotland or Catalonia would be one, and then you have the less than benign cases of that, uh, you know, Kosovo, you know, independence after a conflict, or the Islamic State being a good example of a subnational group that's trying to fundamentally change the map in the in the least. W where are we going with these two competing, you know, political dynamics? Um, how do you see this evolving, and then how will this enter into whether you can use this question of identity and legitimacy to overcome the practical, political, and legal uh, obstacles that Paul has outlined? Francis, you want to start us off? Well, I, once again, I, I take issue with the Europe of 54. Um, we, first of all, we are not talking of an admission of a new state into Europe, it would be, and I'm only in favor of self-determination. I'm not sure that what the answer would be to the second question, should it be independent or not. But uh, we are talking now of a country of 7 million, which is already part of the EU by being part of Spain. So it's a question more of, uh, are you going to expel this uh, or suspend these uh, 7.5 million who are already Europeans, EU members, sorry. So, uh, I, again, the idea that, you know, little Ruthenia or little Friesland will suddenly become in the, in demand independence is, quite honestly, not on. This is the, there has not been the kind of support uh, the, that exists uh, well, at least at the level of the population. So I, I don't, uh, it, but even assuming, now the second point is those of, those of us who were sympathetic to Catalan nationalism or to Catalonia, we are deeply European. It would, we probably would not object to a, f a federal Europe of 54 states it would be no more than four states compared to the 50 states of the U.S. So the, the, the issue, I repeat, is we are, we are, uh, the choice is Catalans and Scots, for that matter, feel extremely strongly about Europe. And certainly the, the Catalans are in the forefront. Um, now, a, again, uh, we are not talking of, for example, I, uh, I, I think the European Union played an extremely poor role in Ukraine. It gave the impression to the Ukrainians that we were going to accept them uh, anytime soon. Now, we in Europe are not going to accept more states inside the EU from outside because of immigration, and certainly not large states like the Ukraine, much as the U.S., would encourage us to do. So, uh, so, uh, so. We could talk about Texas. Right. Uh, so, we are now talking of countries, uh, of a place which is already part of the EU, which already has the freedom of movement, and therefore this kind of obstacle doesn't arise. Well, but, but, uh, Mark, you, you were, I mean, the dilemma when you get into politics is this this question of apples to apples. And, and, and as soon as you know one person says apples to apples, someone's gonna say, no, I want to talk about a pineapple. You know, you know, and and you know, so you know you know in terms of frozen conflict, um, you know, Vladimir Putin, you know, and, and Crimea, you immediately bring back the history of of Kosovo and Abkhazia, South Ossetia, you know. So from a political, I mean, it, it, it is a one question as to what the answer in Brussels would be besides, you know, you know we'll get back to you. Um, but but the, other, the other is that, that, you know, not surprisingly, as Paul said, you know, no sooner did the issue of Scotland come up than, than you have a keen interest, you know, whether it was, um, uh, you know, Madrid, or I'm, I'm sure Brussels on the national side, you know, thought about, you know, um, you know the, uh, the challenge of Flanders and so forth, and all of a sudden now, where, where, where does this go? But it, it, it's, it's more about the, the aspect of political the political dynamic that we are dealing with, where, 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 uh, um, and, and, and where, does, where does this take us? I, I agree that uh, we are in a dynamic which is moving towards global governance, so I think that the, the, the key word here is multi-level governance. So um, when we talk about multi-level governance, 
we talk about making compatible different identities. Identities are not uh, incompatible anymore. And we, the Catalans, as Mr. Vendrell already said, we have a lot, a lot of uh, different identities within Catalonia, which are not necessarily incompatible, which are, which are governed by several institutions. We already have at least four levels of governance, let's say, local governance, regional, state, and European Union. So um, when I talked about federalism and internal self-determination, we could see uh, self-determination in Europe always as an internal self-determination within the European Federation, for instance. But, but isn't, isn't the starting point an incompatibility? You mean the, the you know, Czechoslovakia you know, could not survive the end of the, um, uh, you know, the, the, uh, uh, re the elimination of the Soviet Union. Um, yeah, and and yeah, yeah. It, it was a velvet revolution, but it, wa it was a, a matter of, of you know, two identities that chose not to, or, or one on behalf of two that chose not to coexist. I, I agree on that, sorry. Uh, I, I agree on that, but uh, my point of view is that uh, if we compare apples with apples, we compare liberal democracies to liberal democracies. If we talk about Czechoslovakia, or Soviet Union, um, Kosovo, and other phenomena, we are not talking about government, government arrangements which are within liberal democracies. And in, in liberal democratic movements, we have seen that the solution, as, as it is in Scotland, as it is in Quebec, is neither um, freezing the constitution, but is, it is also not unilateral independence. We have seen both, for instance, secessionist movement in Scotland and secessionist movement in Quebec. They always claim, they always have been pushing forward for economic integration, for sharing uh, powers, and for international agreements, keeping international agreements, and keeping international organizations. So we are not anymore uh, claiming self-determination for isolation, but for sharing different powers at different levels. So I think the, the response to your question is, we are into global multi-level governance, and we should make it work in a liberal democratic context. You've hit, you've hit on a, an issue that's going to be a, a real public policy, uh, public diplomacy challenge for, for the Catalonians, which is, the international community, when you're dealing with self-determination, is a real fruit salad, and, and it's gone bad in, in a lot of places. There's this concern of, of fragmentation of the global world order, with new states popping, popping up everywhere. And, and they had this nasty habit of, of getting into conflict. So Eritrea and Ethiopia had a very nice separation, and then immediately started a war with each other. <laughs> South Sudan, after, after, after years of American and, and European diplomacy and five years of nation building, celebrated its independence and then, by and large, started a civil war within a year or two after that. That's the context in with which you'll be conducting your, your public diplomacy. But you really do have apples to apples when you're talking about Europe. And this is why I use the term frozen economic conflict. I was very careful not to say frozen conflict because you don't want to compare it to the, to the rest of the fruit salad. But here you have a situation where you have an economic infrastructure, you know, the euro, the key, the regulations. You have a nationality infrastructure of sort in the, the EU citizenship that you, many Catalonians will say that they're, you know, they're Europeans first and then, and lots of folks in Europe will, will say that same thing. So thinking of ways in which you can take this debate and have it be a debate about self-determination within the European Union. You'll be flipped into internal and external self-determination because that's what scholars talk about. Create a new discussion point. You're not really seeking external self-determination. You're not leaving Europe. You're not leaving the European Union. You're simply reconfiguring your association within the European Union from being a sub-state entity of Spain to being an independent country still within the structure of the European Union. It's a little bit of law and a lot of public diplomacy for how you reshape this debate. Because we could go on for days about the question that you raised, and we do, <laughs> lawyers. <laughs> we go for it, too. Um, uh, but in the context of Catalonia, it's, it is apples, apples to apples, right. and in all in a good way, because you have the infrastructure, you have the stability, you have the institutions, 
to keep it from even being an economic. Let conflict. me ask one more question before we open up the, to the floor. <coughs> to, to get to this question of apples to apples, what, what, are, the, what are the criteria here? Um, I mean, the dilemma about self-determination you know, you know, gets you to a country like Bahrain. You know, a, a Sunni king that rules a Shia majority, and if you ever had a vote, which Saudi Arabia probably would not let them have in the first place, um, y you, you would fundamentally change the orientation of, of that country. You can look at, um, you know, the artificiality of Afghanistan and Pakistan, and if you ever, you know, talked about nationhood, you know, there would be a Pashtunistan. You know, so, you know, what are the criteria that, that we, we need to identify that would distinguish a Catalonia, you know, from uh, other aspirants, but, you know, ultimately either, for whatever reason, a, a viable state would not be produced. Kurdistan would probably be an example of that. But what do you need to be able to say there, there's, there's this legitimate argument here that separates us from some others so you don't get to a, a e EU at 54? You know, the only point I, I want to make is uh, I think at times you seem to confuse and, and many people do feel self I'm always confused. No, no. Self, <laughs> self, the right to decide self-determination and whether this means independence. And as the chart was uh, pointed out, in many cases, the main reason, in my view, why there is probably, and certainly at times, there has been a large um, percentage of the population in Catalonia that wanted independence was simply because Spain was refusing a referendum. Once you're allowed, the moment you're allowed to decide, the, uh, the moment you decide, uh, then the, the impetus drops. And this has been shown here, it, it happened in Scotland. I, for example, uh, was against Scottish independence. I don't, didn't see any particular reason. Um, so it's not the, uh, a, a view that I'm, we are trying to expand the number of member states. It's a question of what, how do you handle the demand by a territory that has the characteristics of a nation, not of a state, of a nation. How do you handle the demand, a demand to decide one's future or to alter its status? Yeah, yeah just... Uh, a remark on the criteria. Uh, the professor Alan Buchanan from uh, Duke University wrote a famous book in the 91 analyzing the morality of secession, let's say. And he set out uh, certain criteria that I think are, are the basis of any political science debate on, on, on the criteria for secession and self-determination. And these criteria are respecting fundamental values, a functioning democratic system, and peace, let's say. Peace, meaning absence of physical violence. Let's say. When those criteria are, are uh, let's say, uh, fulfilled, and we have a sub-state unit with a certain identity, with a self-government, with a functioning democracy during a long time, and with a tradition of democracy, let's say, uh, we have a case there in which uh, we should discuss at least uh, the legitimacy of its of its uh, self determination. I think it's clear. We cannot say. We cannot say. Usually, uh, we 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 find ourselves in a slippery slope. And then we say, no, that's like, uh, well, then would come Pathania or would come this region, I don't know where, that they are also in Crimea and so on and so forth. Well, uh, well, wait a moment. We have criteria and we do have uh, democratic convictions, I think. And uh, we can use these criteria for distinguishing uh, several uh, different, among different cases, let's say. That's my, my, my answer. Yeah. I would only add to that criteria stability because the, the, to guard against the slippery slope, um, the policymakers will want to think about whether they recognize the substate entity. Will that create? Will that be destabilizing to to the region, or will it enter into enter into conflict? And I think that's important to mention because that is at the core of what policymakers are thinking about. And it's not applicable to Catalonia. There is the infrastructure, and as the institutions that are will interface with the European Union are continuing to be built, there won't be uh, a question of of stability. And uh, putting that out there, I think, helps to bolster the political case. Okay, um, we have time for you know, a couple of questions. We'll start here. Wait for the microphone. Thank you. 
Uh, Identify have, yourself first. Uh, Fernando Jimenez from Technolegal Consult. Um, I am elected member from 2009 of the Spanish Council of Residents in United States. I have carefully listened to all of you. Uh, I would like to Professor uh, Francis Vendray, seeing that he was a former UN Assistant Secretary General nominated by the Spanish government at that time, I'm sure... Excuse me, I was not nominated by the Spanish government. Uh, my positions have always been, I was chosen as a career diplomat of the UN. And, uh, un, and I joined the, the United Nations at the time when the Franco regime was in power, when I was not, and, and I certainly would not have had the approval of the Franco regime had I then, when I first joined the UN. So I am a UN official, an independent career diplomat, and this is what the UN is supposed to be about, the UN Secretariat. Continue. Thank you for the clarification because right. I so thought that... I don't owe anything to yes. the Spanish government, nor yes. do I oppose the Spanish government either. Okay. That's why I think that uh, there is some uh, written communication from Spanish government approval that you were appointed. But anyway, maybe I am wrong. Uh, you have explained the potential and hypothetical historical basis that support an independent Catalonia. Of course, your own point of view. Related to that, my question represents three parameters, past, present, and future. Please let me know if this is incorrect, but in 1492, did the Catholic monarchs not receive Christopher Columbus after his first voyage in the Royal Court of Barcelona? I am on the belief that it was simply a coincidental chance that he was received there because it was the case. The report wouldn't have been named and remembered as Carta de Barcelona in Spanish. Present. I ask you that you forgive me if this reference is untrue or even exaggerated. But I just wish for you all to appease us by agreeing with me when I say that coexistence in a democratic state is only possible when acting in accordance to the law. And the Spanish law system approved democratically and approved in Barcelona and in Catalonia altogether, is not like the, the United Kingdom, nor Scotland, nor Quebec, for that matter. It was defined by the Spanish Constitution in 1978 and democratically approved by the citizens of all Spain, including those of Catalonia. And according to that, the future of the country must be decided by the all of the Spanish population and in no instance simply by the decision of one of its territories. The courts in Spain are the same legal uh, binding that the courts in United Kingdom and United States, etc. There's a question here. Yes, thank you. I thought there were three questions. But anyway, <laughs> uh, fine. Uh, do we take some more? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll take. Yeah, well, but we, let, let, we let me respond let, to that. Let me. Let me. Uh, uh, in a way, uh, uh, I, I'm glad that you brought up the issue of the Catholic kings, even though this is many uh, five centuries ago. Um, as a matter of fact, when uh, Columbus went to the, to America, he went on behalf of Castile. Uh, at that time. Spain had just become uh, a confederal uh, union, a union of monarchs, which hadn't fully yet applied. It began really after Charles I. But nonetheless, it had two, ki two sovereign kings, uh, the Queen of Castile and the King of Catalo uh, Aragon, Catalonia, had married. Uh, it was quite clear that the whole uh, conquest of America, and it was the case until 1714, it was a matter for Castile. For the, uh, whereas the uh, possessions that Spain, now Spain, had in Sicily, Sardinia, and so on, belonged to the Aragonese Catalan monarchy. Now, the union was a personal union, meaning there were parliaments in Castile, and there were parliaments, separate parliaments, in Catalonia, Aragon, and so on. In Catalonia, attempted secession 
in 1640. It was put down by Castile. Uh, that was the time when the Portuguese chose to take advantage of the Spanish or the Castilian army putting down the Catalans for Portugal to declare unilateral independence. It was also, of course, a personal union of monarchies, like England and Scotland. England and Scotland in the 17th century were a personal union. There was a, the king, the same monarch, was monarch of England and a monarch of Scotland. Now, in 1707, uh, the Scots and the British decided uh, jointly that there would be no longer a Scottish parliament, that would then, it would become a real union, and Scotland, the, the new parliament, the parliament in Westminster represented the whole of Great Britain. Or, um, now, in Spain, or in Catalonia, in uh, when the war of the Spanish succession occurred in 1700, uh, the Catalans, perhaps idiotically, perhaps because they still felt that anything that the Castilians wanted was something we didn't want, the fact remains that we supported the Habsburg uh, claimant against the Bourbon claimant. Uh, as we all know, in 1714, the Treaty of Utrecht, sorry, the, uh, the, um, uh, um, this uh, finalized the conflict. That's when Gibraltar became uh, British, but apparently Spain still doesn't recognize uh, this particular entity, despite the fact that it was in an agreement. In the case of Catalonia, the Spanish uh, authorities unilaterally uh, abolished the, the Catalan parliament. So uh, I, I, I think that if anything, the only thing you can say is that you, by the right of conquest, uh, Spain is now the overlord of Catalonia. I'm not, in, and I want to repeat it again because you seem to think that because I support self-determination that I want independence. I simply say that in an advanced, mature democracy, the way to handle this is by asking the people. Now you say we should ask all the people of Spain whether Catalonia should be independent. Now this is a novel approach that uh, the, the, since when would the majority, since when the rights of a, a minority are to be decided by the majority. And now we're not talking here of a minority spread all over the country, let's say the right of Protestants, or, or, or of, um, uh, we are talking now here of the rights of a people who are within a given territory. And this is why in 1978, the constitution made Catalonia a special entity. So um, my answer is no one in, in, in Britain, no one uh, thought that the British people should be consulted about whether Scotland should be independent or should. It was under, understood that this was something for the people of Scotland. And I think Britain took the, the rational and mature approach. You want to choose? You choose. And we'll go with you. We hope you don't leave. And I can assure you that if only this, this relaxed approach was adopted by the government in Spain, that the outcome would be satisfactory for everybody. I, I have one minute left and two questions. Uh, so let's combine them. Ask a very brief question, both of you. You had one there, and then you, and then we'll we'll wrap up the panel. Thank you. Uh, my name is Marco Althaus. I'm a visiting scholar from Berlin, Germany. Currently at the Graduate School of Political Management, this campus. Um, I was wondering about the role of public opinion here. Um, as a country that is one of the very few federal, federalist countries in, in Europe, I'd say that federalism in Europe is really the exception, not the rule. Um, we as a country certainly have lots of uh, public opinion sympathies um, toward the uh, Catalonian case, public opinion. I'd say we sympathize with a nation that is an economic powerhouse in the north. 
that is forced to pay for its poor, disorganized neighbors in the South. Uh, <laughs> so that's one thing. Uh, but uh, generally, do you see public opinion across Europe being more supportive of such movements, uh, whether it's in Germany or in any of the nations, big and small? And what role does economics play in this? That would be, I think, very, very interesting. Not just inside Catalonia, but also right. um, across the continent. OK. Thank you. And then, and then back here. Hi, my name is Rodrigo, and I'm a student here at the George Washington University. So I wanted to kind of follow up with this question and what you'll be talking about. When you said that it isn't relevant as much what the rest of the Spanish country thinks in this matter, I wanted to pose the question of whether we have considered, first of all, if there is truly a majority public opinion that supports independence, because I think we're all assuming here that Catalonia wants independence. And the last poll actually said that 48 percent of people in Catalonia are against independence compared to 44 who are for it. So there's a majority of people in Catalonia who are against independence. That's the first thing. The second thing, let's say in Catalonia did become independence. We're talking about the, the autonomous community in, in Spain that has the highest debt and receives the most amount of money from the central government. We're talking about a taxpayer money from all of Spain that goes into Catalonia and where there is patrimony in Catalonia that belongs to all Spanish citizens. So I wanted to pose the question of how do you think this is not truly a question of all of Spain deciding on its own future, on its own economic, political future, and its own prop public property? Thank you. Two great questions that obviously lend themselves to brief 15-second answers, but Paul, you want to start off and <laughs> going into the north-south European <laughs> politics or the intra-Spanish politics? Um, I'll give you a legal answer. The good news is um, the law is pretty clear on these referendums on self-determinations. It is the sub-state entity concerned that, that votes, and that's the whole sort of question of self-determination. Um, and there's a whole raft of laws that keep lawyers very busy on questions like federal assets, federal debt, the national patrimony that you had, you had discussed, lots of criteria relating to equitable and equal sharing. So it only takes you guys a year to have a referendum. It takes the lawyers five or six to sort out a lot of those questions related to the financial and the, and the treaty-based matters. So that's a slight legal dodge, but I'll pass it on to the other two panelists. <laughs> Well, yeah, uh, thank you, visiting scholar. Um, just uh, two quick remarks on public opinion. I think there is a growing tendency just to know about the Catalan case. People didn't know about sub-state uh, demands in Spain. And I think this is changing, the situation is changing. And nowadays we have a lot of uh, debate, even in Germany, in newspapers and so on, on the Catalan case. So I think that's just this fact is good news, and then we could discuss if it's a positive or negative uh, at the point of view and so on. And on the economics, of course, of course, economics play a crucial role, but usually, uh, uh, let's say, uh, those who argue against Catalan self-determination use the economic argument uh, like uh, in the sense that uh, this would be an egoistic uh, claim or an egoistic uh, um, demand against uh, reindications from the South, as Rodrigo, point, uh, as Rodrigo pointed out uh, just now. So, but I think that there is, there, it has more to do with uh, how economics are managed by Spanish government and how the economic crisis <coughs> the impact of the economic crisis has, uh, let's say, undermined or has, uh, let's say, downplayed the Catalan autonomy. So it has more to do with autonomy and the powers for managing economy than, uh, let's say, m the money you have in your pocket it itself, let's say, which is, of course, related to how, how economics are managed. I don't know if I explain myself. So and just a, a remark on, on Rodrigo's uh, question. I agree with you. Uh, the Span all the Spaniards have something to say on the Catalan case. But uh, I, I, uh, let, let me play a uh, tennis table, let's say, and, and give you back the question. Um, do you think that the current situation is encouraging debate on the Catalan topic? Or the, the, the Spanish government uh, position is just blocking this debate? Is just blocking the possibility of knowing if it's true that there is a minority of Catalans for independence or a majority. Uh, you are very brave and you say, well, I know that the 
majority of Catalans are against independence. Well, as a political scientist, I have been studying data from the last, from the last years. Well, that, I would say I don't know. Nowadays, we have 50-50. So um, let the Catalans vote, and then, and then maybe in a non-binding referendum, let's say. And then uh, we can talk about that. That would be my answer. Uh, very, very briefly, again, a confusion between independence and self-determination. <laughs> Uh, yes, you, it may well be that there is a minority, only a, a large minority in favor of independence, but there is a large majority in favor of the right to decide. And, this, and second, on the issue of whether Spain should vote, I, don't, I suppose you would have asked then Russia whether they accepted the independent, to vote on the independence of the Baltic states, of Ukraine, and the others. Uh, and the same you would have asked the Serbs to vote on the independence of Kosovo. Join me in thanking our panelists for a great discussion.